Welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. I'm D.W. Draffin, and today we are talking about the diseases in ancient faces. We're talking with Otto Appenzeller, a medical doctor and neurologist and professor emeritus from the University of New Mexico. He has worked with the Department of Paleontology at the Natural History Museum in the UK, the British Museum, and the Department of Greek and Roman Antiquities in London. Apologies for the sound issues. We hope that subtitles are sufficient. Hello, Dr. Appenzeller. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are excited and fascinated by your research, and we can't wait to hear more about it. So uh, first, let me ask you, what brought you first to the idea of paleopathology? Well, diseases change with time. And so it is important to know now, specifically with the COVID uh, infections that have come upon us and that will disappear and another virus will come on. It is important to know whether and what sort of diseases were present in the long distant past. And one way of trying to find that out is to use what we call iconodiagnosis, that is the diagnosis of diseases as depicted in ancient paintings and sculptures, because then we can say that say 2000 years ago, the disease was present or not present. It is very likely that it only are viral diseases that change instantaneously over a year or two. It is very likely that the diseases depicted using iconography, that is, in paintings and sculptures that are old, are still present today, because viral diseases don't change the appearance of your face or limbs. Did I make myself clear? You look rather puzzled. <laughs> no, my head is whirling with so many uh, implications. I, I have to assume that when you began, there was a lot of resistance to the idea that it feels like something that an uninformed layman would first assume that they could make a diagnosis from paintings and then have trained archaeologists laugh them off. But you have the background, the medical skills, and the archaeological. Uh, this is an important po uh, point. When we make an iconodiagnosis, we want to be sure that that diagnosis is correct. And on occasion, I've used a friend of mine, Clifford Qualls, PhD, who is a professional statistician. And so we combine a exact science statistics with a rather wishy-washy sort of thing, your impressions of a painting, what you perceive in a painting and may be different from what I perceive, because what you see and I see is then dependent on the different brain, your brain and my brain, which are clearly different. That you were able to find paintings and statuary, visual representations of humans who may have uh, certain diseases but then you were able to actually access many of the bodies and confirm it. I just keep thinking of the phrase Rosetta Stone. A statistical phrase, a significant likelihood 
P less than 0 0.001. Wow. That what I say is correct. I'd like to get to some of the specific uh, cases that you have worked on. Uh, many, many, many cases uh, that you've found uh, over the years. Yeah. Well, so here, my favorite thing is the gold mask of Agamemnon. And these masks were made by using a thin sheet of gold that was pressed over the face of the deceased to give an image as it was after death. And this image of Agamemnon shows something extraordinary. When you look at the eyes, the left eye is larger and the mustache on the left is a little droopy. The lips are slightly turned down and that indicates that Agamemnon, if indeed it was Agamemnon, we don't know that, but it was some guy, the gold mask was excavated in the 19th century, a whole trove of gold objects were found, including that mask. So this fellow, whoever he was, had a left facial paralysis because of the larger eye on the left. From a medical point of view, do you then wonder if this facial paralysis was indicative of the condition that maybe killed this individual? Yes, Bell Paul. No, not killed, absolutely not. This facial palsy didn't kill the guy. Bell's palsy isn't fatal. Yeah, he must have died from something else. Most likely, he died from a war injury, eventually. Initially, he was hit on the head, and he got a facial palsy from that. And in those days, warriors continued to fight. It's such a problem to bring the details of ancient history to life. In almost every case, we have nothing but numbers or some ruins on a horizon. But to actually get such specific details of an individual, their interior biological uh, processes included, it's just utterly fascinating. Well, I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and you have so many of these. At first, I, I thought... Yeah. Yes. Well, of course, it's a treasure trove. Let's, let's look at the use from the mummy portrait from the year 70 to 120 of the current era. So if you look at this mummy portrait, which was painted by unknown artists and made to reflect the way the dead individual looked during life. And you can see that this young man had very strong eyebrows, a long nose, a mustache that was drooping like in Agamemnon. And now look to the right or left, whatever you want to look at, of a modern young girl. First, you can see her there with strong eyebrow and with a droopy mouth, very much like in the use. And we used modern technique in 1997 to get an image of what her brain, not his. He don't, they didn't have a brain anymore. It's just a, <laughs> it's a painting. Yes. What her brain would have looked like. You can see an asymmetry in these white patches, which are the holes 
in the brain that we all have. First, is larger on one side than the other, and the surface of the brain on her is sort of uneven on one side and the other one is smooth. So presumably, this was the case also with this young man on the painting on his mummy portrait. So we assume that he had progressive facial hemiatrophy, which means that his right side is going to get smaller. And you can see another person with the same condition. Her name is Geshe Meyer. She was painted in 1652, mm. again by an unknown artist. And if you look at her face, you can see the smaller eye, the strong eyebrows, the droopy mouth. She also has progressive facial hemiatrophy. Looking at these images, I've actually seen the young man's image before in some of the collections that I've done on Egyptian figures and art before. And when I saw it myself as an untrained layman, seeing the imbalance on his features only registered to me as a stylistic or artistic choice. It required your uh, precise medical training to see what the rest of us do not. We have here a more modern painting, Judas of Holofernes. Well, she looks very attractive. But look at her eyes. Right eyelid is droopy. Clearly so. She was painted by Gustav Klimt, one of the most famous Austrian authors. We have such documentation on uh, this time period, Klimt's career. Do we know who the model was? Uh, do we know yes, about we do. her medical background? The model was Adele Bach Bauer. So she had congenital right sided ptosis, droopy eyelid. And do we know, and I'm thinking about our previous examples as well, are there uh, single causes for many of these, or are there many possible environmental factors that could lead to these? No, this. <laughs> Congenital ptosis is not environmentally induced. And is this true of the conditions that the Egyptian youth and the Brahmin woman also suffered? Uh, are you able to somewhat uh, uh, diagnose the pathology of how they might have actually acquired their conditions? Yeah, you, you diagnose the condition by simply looking. And then you have some more examples. Henry III and his son, Henry III in A and his son in B. Yes. You can see that it is congenital, it's inherited. Once again, those are uh, images that the rest of us look at and perhaps um, see the asymmetrical eyes as a choice of the artist or even that is a... correct. I'm sure that a daily block bower was considered a perfect woman and they neglected to take note of her droopy island. For that you would have to have a neurological education and a good one. The medical, scientific, technical, the archeological and historical, um, being able to fuse all of these things together. There's a new age in science where we're pushing back our understanding of early history. Now I have King Stephen. He had, when you look at his painting, uh, what ordinary people would call cross-eyed 
And the most common disease that would give rise to that is diabetes. So this weakness that he had at that time, he probably ate too many cakes. <laughs> He gave him diabetes, and there he was, cross-eyed. The eye, when you look at a face of a living individual, what catches you most is the eyes, and the rest of the face is mostly ignored. Tell us more about the portrait of a youth from the third century of the current era. You see a picture of a modern patient with what is called facial scapular humoral muscular dystrophy, FSHD, which is a condition of the muscle to the right or left of that woman is a mummy portrait. And when you look at the mummy portrait painted around the time of Christ, you can see that that painting made, as I said before, to look like the deceased has very similar features, the sunken cheeks, the weak muscles of the face, the sort of sleepy look, the look of inability to move her facial muscles. If she had been able to talk, her voice would have been uh, sort of like this because she couldn't move her facial muscles. A Greco painting of his own eye. Yes. And you can see that his left eye, the pupil, was larger than the right eye. And he had a droopy eyelid on the right side. And when you look at the mummy portrait, you can see the same feature. The left eye is larger than the pupil, and the right eye is smaller. And so this mummy portrait and El Greco's self-portrait show that they both had what we call now Horner's syndrome. And below you see a pictures, two pictures showing in modern people what they look like. Small pupil on the right, Larger pupil on the left, a droopy eyelid on both sides. They both had Horner's syndrome. There were 1500 years or so separating the two paintings. Third century, 1586 for El Greco. This is usually traumatic. So it's there, you know, somebody hits you in the head mm. or on the neck and severs certain structures. Or you may have congenital one or maybe born like this. One more thing I want to show you is of a mummified hand with bandages still on. And we were able to show by analogy that this woman who was of Nubian descent assists in a part of the lower brain when she was alive. And did you have the entire mummy or you only had the hand? Uh, I only, the only thing available is what you will see in the picture. And that was found in a sarcophagus that is in a, in a burial casket came from Egypt and we use statistics again to determine that she was black of Nubian descent. Mm -hmm. She wasn't Egyptian. And there is a condition that you were able to find in her extremities that proved 
a cyst existed in her brain? Yes, the hand uh, that is depicted and is available to look at is deformed in such a way that it is likely she had a cyst, a cavity in her brain. Thank you so much for showing us all of these examples and really bringing so many of these people back to life in ways that we never expected. Thank you very much to Otto Appenzeller for all of his experience and wisdom, for all of his examples, and for his many, many papers, and for all the study that he's done over the years to bring history back to life. Uh, Dr. Otto Appenzeller, thank you once again. Thank you. Have a good time.